Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 234 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. You may hear something weird in the audio. Uh, I am in a hotel room in Colorado Springs. I'm here for Superstars Writing Seminars. I neglected to pack my really good microphone, but I'm also on a time crunch. And so this is going to be a shorter than normal episode, but this episode is going to be a reflection on a talk that I gave to Kathy Mack's class. Now, I'm going to also include a link to uh, the wording around episode. I had uh, Kathy, one of her students on probably last year, uh, maybe, um, I'll, again, I'll find a link to it and post it in the show notes. But what I did is I, I recently did a class for her university uh, level um, class on uh, literary publishing. And, and a lot of university classes look at publishing only in the, tra- the traditional sense. And so, again, Kathy's one of those instructors that wants to make sure her students are fully informed of the possibilities uh, beyond the limits of uh, traditional publishing. Yes, traditional publishing is still very valid. There's still some great opportunities there. But this is uh, beyond that. And so uh, I was just there uh, and I did a bit of a talk, probably a 40-minute talk, then a bit of a Q&A. But then Kathy recorded afterwards... Uh, with her students, some of their reflections, and I absolutely love the reflections uh, that they shared, so I'm sharing it with you. It's only about a 15-minute clip, uh, and it's based on uh, you know, that part of the conversation. She sent it to me very graciously, so uh, thank you to Kathy and uh, to her uh, awesome students for the reflections, because the one thing a speaker rarely gets to do is you rarely get to hear the reflections when you're not in the room. Uh, of what people remembered from the, the, the talk you gave, uh, what stuck with them, or, or even the things that they didn't pick up on, because th- that could help me, uh, you know, uh, figure out ways to s- say it in a better way or communicate it more clearly or more effectively, kind of like when you get feedback from an editor, right? So anyways, that's coming up later in this episode. There's going to be uh, uh, a brief ad read uh, about this episode's sponsor. And uh, I'm probably going to just forego the uh, personal uh, stuff for this episode so we can get right into the the main content. This episode is sponsored by Find Away Voices. Find Away Voices offers authors a unique opportunity to get their audiobooks out into the global market with distribution to more than 43 retail and library platforms. And with Find Away Voices, you can be all in, you can go to all the platforms through them, or you can pick and choose. You can decide where you may want to go direct, where you may want to use Find Away Voices. Speaking of choice, just recently launching a marketplace to allow you to find professional narrators on your own. You can also use their more uh, project-managed system where you fill out uh, sort of an RFP, but what you're looking for, and then they go uh, to their team of professionals who've worked in the industry to find you between five to 10 of the best narrators. Or if you have your own audiobook, you can just upload it directly. With Find Away Voices, you always have choice. You're always in control. And I just finished an amazing opportunity through Chirp Books, which is owned by BookBub. Uh, and I had a Chirp Book deal, and you can only get into Chirp through Find Away Voices, but I had a Chirp Book deal. And uh, it was an amazing experience uh, selling a whole bunch of my audiobooks. Yes, it was down to 99 cents, but the volume really helped me earn back the money I invested in at least one of the one of those four books uh, that was selling. But again, opportunities for promotion through Chirp and Apple, opportunities to uh, change your price and be in control of your price and decide how you want to get your audiobook out there. So if you're looking for ways to leverage your audiobook career as an author, and you want to see how you can leverage Findaway Voices, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. (laughs) 
So the next thing that I wanted to do is just a quick reflection. Well, not a quick. I actually want to do a fairly deep dive into a reflection of the talk that Mark gave on the business of being a writer. I think the things that I remembered best was his references for publishing houses and also his tips about ways to, like, connect with your community. Something he said that really stuck out to me was when he was talking about putting passion into your project. It's something that I knew, but it still got me thinking a little bit about how I portray my own work and, you know, do I write what makes me passionate or do I write what other people want? It's it's a bit of a weird thing to remember, but it made me think a little bit about my own work this past few days. Yeah, and did anybody else sort of riff off of that particular idea? Or I kind of did. What he was saying about branding was kind of um, interesting to me because I want to do all these stupid things, and nothing, nothing has any coherence. Like, like right now I'm writing um, a, like a tragic play. And then I'll turn around and write a satire uh, comparing Superman and Jeff Bezos. And it's just a bunch of dick metaphors. Like, a, like I don't know what kind of brand, uh, <laughs> what kind of brand you could have around that kind of thing. But I don't know if it's, I don't know if my, like my target audience, my little niche thing would be uh, just people who like my specific kind of quality of weirdness that I apply to everything. I think that's what I would like to think. But, yeah. Sarcasm among journalism journalists is not new. I mean, in terms, he was talking about comparable texts. Gopnik comes to mind. Anyway, so those are yeah, that's possible. Anybody I'm else? Just gonna say, I understand where Jacob's coming from. The one consistency among all my work is that I really like writing tragedy, despite the fact that I myself have not experienced much tragedy in my life. <laughs> And finding that kind of thing that's going to keep people coming back, i it's hard to pinpoint, I find. Branding is not, branding, it shouldn't be limiting you. It should just identify you. And stories, I mean, stories have to have tragedy or else, you know, horror, people are kind of horrible. We like stories where we put our protagonists through a really hard time. And then, of course, they triumph over, over adversity and we feel really good about that. Yeah, don't worry about the tragedy thing. Anybody else have any of those similar similar discussions? Like, that's actually a lot of different things. Personally, I found when he was talking about being a hybrid author, yeah, that's what he called it, that was really interesting because I always, you know, Whenever I would hear about it from, I think we had like one writer come to school at one point or something. They never gave that as a possibility that you could feasibly do both. I just never got the idea that you could actually do both. You mean both traditional and and yeah. digital? Yeah. No, it's huge. I also thought that was that was one of the points I actually wrote down was that I was surprised that to make the most amount of money you can, you would ideally have a hybrid kind of publishing cycle, which to me was like totally weird. But I mean, it kind of makes sense. Once you have a following, it would be much easier to self-publish and then get the, the material out there when you have people looking for your your book. It's that thing you say, you know, I'd rather have one fan who buys all my books than, you know, sell one book to a bunch of people. There's a really popular Facebook page and a book and a conference called 20 Books to 50K. And the idea is that if you have 20 books out there and you're making $10 a day on your 20 books, then you are making $50,000 a year, right? And that's not an over-the-moon sort of a goal. Completely different take on publishing, though, than you'll mostly find in a university situation, right? Mostly it's about being true to your art. And the truth of all of these things that we talk about, the very first thing is, first, write a good book. <laughs> like, you have to do that first before we get to the business part. But this is a literary publishing class, so this is what we talk about. What else? What else did people think about? I don't know, Renelle, Ren, do you have anything? Um, it wasn't so much related to the publishing aspect. I really just enjoyed when he was talking about or more like wondering about what makes a book last. And I think we ended up that it was like the universality of it. I just like that whole discussion. <laughs> yeah, the universal universality of the feelings inside of it. Yeah. Of the, 
not even necessarily the plot, but the, I, the, the theme that goes underneath it. Yeah. When I teach creative writing, you know, like the last thing on my list of things you should do when you're um, workshopping is state, this is a book about, this is a story about, and get into that. And we hardly ever do that because it's hard. And quite often we don't know until you've done like 25 iterations. You go, oh, this is really about love in adversity, or this is really about how shared pain is lessened and shared joy increased. You know, there's a lot of uh, possibilities there. Okay, anybody else? Danya, did you have something that we haven't talked about yet? I saw you nodding in a couple of places. Yeah, most of my stuff was, most of the stuff that I remember that I really liked was like, you know, the idea of like uh, doing traditional and digital because I think that's interesting idea with the hybrid and I liked the um you know like he did like the whole like comparison of the two and you know the benefits of either or and then like the downfalls and then also uh if you go your own way and you the work that goes along with that and the different options that you have and the whole like commu- uh, creating like a community and target audience and branding kind of you know stuff like that it's an interesting concept to think about and some of the stuff he talked about reminded me of some of the stuff that you know we've talked about in class and so it's just like nice to get a good idea yeah well a lot of um a lot of the stuff that i know about literary publishing especially digital literary publishing was from his blog (laughs) so it's not surprising that (laughs) you're getting a consistent message there Uh, I, i really liked his story about rebranding about having the wrong subtitle on that book about the snowman shivers because it wasn't horror it was dark humor so when he said it was a tale of horror or tales of horror about snowmen it got into the wrong hands it got to the wrong community it got to the wrong audience when he changed it to dark humor it was started getting into the right audience right okay and anybody else have anything that we haven't talked about yet? Um, I was surprised. Oh, sorry, killed. Oh, no, you're <laughs> right. uh, uh, I was surprised. That so many books just do terrible and don't may, ever make back the uh, initial investment. We say that it's like, I don't know, most books. <laughs> well, on the other hand, have you read a lot of things that are on subscription services? A lot of them are not edited properly. It breaks my heart, actually. I really, really hate to read a story or start a story. Quite often I can't finish them. But I think, ah, this is a great character. And this plot has such potential. And it's never going to be what it should have been. Right? They they published it too soon. I find that heartbreaking. Speaking of of not... (laughs) doing very well. I got a message from draft to digital which is where we published Wording Around with Pros a year and a half ago, and I got the, the tax form for our earnings from last year. Can you see how much we earned? Wow. A whole $18. I think that's three copies we sold. Now I haven't done anything with it for a year and a half. Woohoo! Yeah, let's go buy a couple of slices of pizza. <laughs> but uh, but I mean I've done nothing with it. The, to me, I'm slowly slowly building here with with the uh, wording around. Eventually, I want to do bundles and like I can see this becoming something, but it isn't there yet, and I don't have the energy to put into it. I, I also have a friend. She retired, she writes consistently, she posts on the Big River website, (laughs) and like she's done a multi-volume science fiction series in long poetry. And like there is no audience. (laughs) There really, really is no audience for this. It's interesting and yay! I don't know. <laughs> That's some of the ones that make less than 10 bucks a year, right? There's a lot of people that do that just to say they've done it. All right. Let me just back up over what you guys said. References to publishing houses. What did you mean by that, Liz? 
Oh, I just met that some of the publishing houses he had mentioned, I hadn't heard of them before, so I'm keeping note of them. Like Dundurn? Yeah. Yeah. You might want to go on the Writers Union of Canada website. They have, I think they have a list of publishing houses. They have this set of little handbooks, which you get for free if you're a member. Um, if you're not a member, I think they cost like 10 bucks or 15 bucks. And I'm pretty sure publishing houses is one of them. I saw a few people nodding when Jake started talking about branding. What did you what did you remember about the discussion about branding? I think one thing that what he said was interesting was the fact that you have to understand that you won't be able to please everyone, that sometimes your book just won't appeal to some people. And that was hard because my mom says I do a good job. <laughs> <laughs> no, like I've understood that, you know, the things I write aren't for everybody, but it sort of makes sense to, to you know, carve out yourself a little identity in certain circles like uh i write real world stuff all the time but i would like to try fantasy and sci-fi but for those two i guess i just have to make like different brandings for myself in those things so it's not like you're stuck in one sort of thing the, um there's, that's why authors use pen names right they'll have one pen name for their romance series and one for their serious literature series yeah it's very it's becoming more and more reified if you are a science fiction author, then that's what you write. And if you write a, a book of realism, you're not going to be able to bank on your readership, the readership of your science fiction series. It's very rare that you get somebody like Margaret Atwood who does realism but also does science fiction and everybody just buys everything because she's Margaret Atwood, right? It's a it's a different, different world. That's the thing that's that I was kind of... Um wondering with my brand because that's what i would do you remember the um the story i did uh in my first year about uh some science fiction shit i like to think it's all based on realism but still it's science fiction so whatever yeah. the good science fiction good fantasy is always i mean the human dimension is the same whether or not it's a problem in the real world you know you've set up a real ordinary world or you've set up a a world where the laws of physics and uh, don't apply in the same way. It doesn't matter. It all comes down to human relationships, you know, whether or not the conflicts are, are resolved through military means or magical means, right? It doesn't matter. I mean, I'm not thinking about big, big conflicts. It's the relationships between the humans that are making those conflicts that matter, I think. Okay. Did anybody have any uh, more refinements on the things that we've talked about already? I think the only other point I had was I'm starting to, to believe you guys when you say that you have to immerse yourself in the community. <laughs> it's been it's repeated, so. <laughs> that so yeah, tells me it's important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't just, we're not just up here flapping our gums for the fun of it. I have to tell you, it's hard. It's hard for introverts to do that, but it's good. <laughs> Did he say anything that you disagree with? I, I didn't really understand what, was, what, what the, his little anecdote was about a writer who manuscript um, wouldn't get accepted, but then I think he submitted it somewhere and it won an award and then it got published and it was just like a, after that it was like a hit. Yeah, so I think the point that he was making is that publishers get it wrong. People can get really depressed at having multiple rejections. This Christmas, a friend of mine who does the reviews editing for the Windsor Review asked me to review all of the nominees for the Governor General's Award in poetry this year, do a, like a big omnibus review, because I had been nominated for the Governor General's Award. So I got out my files and I found my rejection letters for that book. And it got rejected from 10 presses before it got accepted, right? But then it, it won the uh, Lampert Award for the best first book of poems in Canada that year. And it was nominated for the Governor General's. So publishers may reject your book for reasons that have nothing to do with the quality of your book. It might be you know, I would love to, to publish your manual on how to write prose, but we already have one of those in our list. And 
if we publish another one, we'll have two books that are competing against each other. So we're not going to publish it, right? There's all sorts of reasons why books that don't get published that have nothing to do with the quality. It's like being in a workshop. Take the critiques seriously, but don't take them to heart. Don't get depressed over them. You know, it just means this is a chance to make the thing better, right? And it's the same thing with a rejection from somewhere. I never turned something around and sent it out again until I looked it over again. And then once I'd looked it over again, I might have made some changes and I sent it out again. So by the time it had gone, my manuscript had gone out 10 times, it was really good. <laughs> okay. Well, that is uh, the main content for this particular podcast. I'm recording this at the front of the room at Superstars Writing Seminars in Colorado Springs. Uh, it's Wednesday morning, which would be February 10th. And we're just getting ready for the very first day, craft day, uh, of this amazing conference. And so I thought I'd, uh, instead of doing this in the hotel room, I thought I'd do it here. But what I wanted to reflect on is, uh, again, it's really valuable to hear the feedback from the students after after you uh, do such a talk. And a, a rare experience, both for me as well as for you, dear listener. I wanted to reflect on one thing Kathy said. And it was about author branding, and I thought that was really important. And it had to do with a brand shouldn't limit you. It should uh, help you uh, in different ways of defining yourself. And I thought that was a really important thing that she talked about in uh, in that. And it was a very subtle thing. Well, she did. She said it, and it stuck out with me. And I thought, yeah, that's exactly what it is. That's what a brand does, is a brand helps create the different awareness uh, elements that you need. It's not supposed to limit you. It's not supposed to prevent you from something. It's supposed to help you with you and your brand. But anyways, as I said, it's a busy week, so this is it for this slightly shorter episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. If you want to support the podcast, you can join the awesome family of patrons over at patreon.com slash starkreflections. And a special thank you to all my awesome patrons and all you awesome listeners. And so, until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie LeFay wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.